Let us pray. Lord, the words we have shared and the experience of our lives are at best a vision dimly seen when it's only us. Lord, help our understanding now with your eternal truth and empower us with a revelation in your Holy Spirit as we reflect upon your word to inspire our lives to become beacons of hope and signs of your love for all to see. All to your glory. In Christ we pray. Well, here we are in the year 2020, and if there was ever a time to consider whether we were seeing things rightly, this year is named just for that. When your eye doctor says that you have 2020 vision, it means, obviously I don't have 2020 vision, but it means that within the 20 foot range, you can see what is visible to most everyone else looking at 20 things at a 20 foot range. It means you have normal, complete vision, but there are people, usually they're young people, but there are some people who have 2010 vision or 2015 vision, which means they see things more clearly. At the same distance where you might see things clearly, they see things even more clearly. And then there are some, there are those who in seeing things as well as you can see them, discern patterns and are able to use their vision to understand more than those who perhaps take their sight more for granted. They have a good interpretive vision, a way of understanding what they see that should inspire and encourage us. Now that's, that's just our eyes. That's just what our eyes can do. We know it takes more than our eyes to see something. Have you ever been looking for your keys and find them right under your nose, or worse yet, right in your hand? You can have the best eyesight in the world, but in order to see, you have to look. And in order for all that looking to be worthwhile, you have to observe. Let's look at our situation. We are a world in crisis, we are a society in crisis, we are a church in crisis, and we are not new to crisis. This particular crisis is more intense, it's in our face. We can't miss this, we can't turn our vision to something else. There is a virus. Let's look at this situation. Let's look at this world's crisis and make sure we are seeing it right, that we are seeing it together. This all seems to have started in Asia, in China, perhaps in a market in Wuhan, as some have suggested. Perhaps we need to look more deeply into what took place there, but you and I are not permitted to go there. Nor is it pertinent for us discovering and really seeing what we need to see it. At this point, focusing our attention there and becoming caught up in what happened there isn't going to help us because the picture that we need to see is much bigger. If you just look there, we're looking at too small. The virus transmitted through a dense population very quickly, which spread because it corresponded to a time when people are usually very mobile. And while serious in that it was new or novel. The virus was hard to predict, difficult to test for, and symptoms and treatments were hard to assess. And the mistakes that were made began being made by a growing number of people. There are, sure, people to question, people to go back, and perhaps there is some blame. But casting judgment elsewhere does not help us see things here and now within our visual reign, because this disease spread. This virus moved through the human population in a way that we have not seen in a century. It moved among business travelers and vacationers. We are a very mobile people now. We are all over the world. And by the middle of last month, it was being recognized all over the world. People were 
getting sick. And among those who were first sick, an alarming number were dying. And panic rose. Some nations reacted. They closed transportation, quarantined people who were suspected of being exposed. People were trapped on cruise ships, in hotel rooms, at resorts, but also in places in the world where they never expected to be in the first place. Some of them are still there. They need your prayers, and they need to be remembered in all of this. The crisis for them is very acute. But where we are, here in North America, people began to recognize that this was coming onto our shores, into our land. And we reacted in a way that we haven't reacted for anything in my living memory. I don't think it was just that a few people started watching movies about diseases and got too caught up in it. The mass population grew in fear. Anxiety has grown. It's still in a lot of households, though we've gone into a bit of a waiting period. A lot of people made bad decisions. Bad information made its rounds. Misinformation. There were blind Lies, there were half-truths, and worse yet, there were our own presumptions. I don't think I need to repeat much of what went on from then till now because the distance isn't, isn't very long. But I need to emphasize that now is not the time to become blind. To close our eyes and hope it will all go away, as some of us in our social separation are are doing and are expecting that this, if we hide long enough, it'll all go away and it won't be there when, when we want to come out again, when we're told to come out again. We need to have a more mature attitude about this. I was around in Halifax when H1N1 made the rounds and some of my friends got sick from it and it was very bad. It was really frightening. Some of my friends were close to death. They were very sick. And I was around for SARS, and I felt threatened by just how virulent that disease seemed, and how I was sure that what's happening now was about to happen then. But those experiences do not compare or prepare me for what is going on right now, and I don't think it prepared anyone for that. Now is a very defining time for a lot of people, for culture, for community, and for faith. Even if no one else dies, and I believe people will still die, all our lives have been deeply disrupted. We are seeing things in a whole new way. We have been traumatized by this. Our children are confused and bewildered about what is going on. Our seniors already vulnerable, already feeling very limited because of what is lost when it comes to later in life, feel constantly under threat. The church cannot be blind. The church cannot act as though it is not seeing what is going on. We must be more vigilant and more aware. We can't lick our wounds and we can't become victims in this crisis. We were, as a church, as blind as the rest of the world to what was happening. Oh, there were people who were aware and were sharing the news, but as a whole, I don't believe we thought it would come to this. It was going to happen somewhere else, as it always does to someone else. Well, now it isn't. This is a global reality. We cannot assume that we are going to go back to the same normal after all of this either. We cannot stop seeing now that we have been made no longer blind. When Jesus encounters our blindness like he did with the man at the temple, he invites us to see beyond the blindness, to see God at work. 
Because hardship and suffering remove the veneer that we paste over much of life to make it what we want to be, to make it serve us. When we mourn, when we grieve, when we lose, that is when we discover who our friends are. That's often when we learn what kind of person we really are. It is a time of reflection. Oh, we could have done this earlier at better times in life, but nothing is learned like a hard lesson. People want to blame God for these troubles. Fine, blame God. God made all things. In Christ, all things are made. God created the virus. God did not make us dig it up in nature, though, and throw it into society. God did not keep people from washing their hands or from going out when they should have stayed home or from doing all things that have spread this virus all around the world. God does not keep us from communicating from one another, even though we are socially isolated. God does not make our scientists compete instead of cooperate for the cure. God does not make some people go out and try and profit off of other people's suffering or for us to keep to ourselves that which could be shared. Just so, God did not make the virus to bring judgment, to bring it down on humanity, but God made a virus that if we were foolish enough not to take it seriously, because surely the world does not take God seriously, that if we were to not take it seriously, for us to think that we could keep whatever we want under control just because we're all so smart, that's not a judgment from on high. That is us learning another lesson the hard way. Jesus tells his disciples, the man is not blind because anyone sinned. We're not facing this because of any specific sin. It didn't happen in China because they were doing something to the Bible. It's not moving through society to pick out those who sinned against God. Jesus tells his disciples that that man's not blind because anybody sinned, but in order for people to see God at work. Now we've already read ahead. I know, you know how this, this, this you know how this goes. Jesus heals the blind man, but I want us to pause the story before the healing happens. I want us to pause at Jesus' words where he says, this man is blind in order for people to experience, to, to recognize, to see God manifest, to see God present, to see God at work. Before the miracle, before the sign, Jesus is really talking about more than just the miracle he's about to perform. Jesus doesn't disregard that man's whole life up to that point. Jesus is, setting, is not setting aside every coin that was tossed into his plate, every morsel of food that he was given, the clothes that were put on his back, the hard work and the struggle his parents went through in order to, to get that man to that point in life. At least he had a good place to be. And in that society, sometimes that's the best you could do as a parent for someone who was disabled. People had an opportunity to show grace. Humanity had a chance to lift that man up, even with his blindness, to love him and cherish him, and in that show the presence of God not from some prophet coming to town or the true Lord of all but in themselves. Just as you do, just as Jesus calls on you to do, to the least of these that are given unto us. You know, I'm like you. I'm praying for that miracle. I see the, 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 the tests for new vaccines going on, and I'm filled with hope, and I am so impressed at our ingenuity as a being. But I don't depend on that. My hope is in God. I'm amazed, though, as we wait for that miracle, as we wait 
for this all to end. I am amazed at the signs, the manifestation of God's love that's to be witnessed, celebrated, recognized, uplifted as worship by the church before God. The signs of compassion in the response of so many people. There are missions throughout the world that aren't going to close. They're going to stay open. They're going to feed the sick, feed the hungry. They're going to heal the sick. They're going to care for those who are marginalized. There are resource centers that are just working so hard to reorganize how they do things so that they can continue that life-saving, that life-restoring, that dignity-preserving work that they have been doing. I am so pleased to see that even though we've seen the horrible side of humanity in this, that there are so many people who recognize, recognize the moral depravity of what some people have done. The greed, the hoarding, the, the profiteering, the not following safe protocols for distancing, the washing and cleansing. And not just for themselves, but saying these things out loud. There is a sense of right and wrong. And it's just so sad that it took something like this for us as a society to, to reclaim that we know and can be good, that we can be generous more than selfish, that it isn't about what we can get out of it. It's about what we can share in the midst of it. People are praying for and encouraging health care workers, truckers, essential service workers, small business owners. We're praying for each other. We're looking out for each other. And I hope and I pray that as COVID-19 goes away, and someday it will, these wonderful manifestations of the love of God don't disappear from our society. Because if there's a miracle in all of this, even as we come to a cure, and I pray we do, the miracle is the manifestations of God's love that we are meant to see open our eyes to stop being blind and to see. But you know something else I'm seeing? And I know you're seeing it too, but you might not realize that you're seeing it. Right now, you are being a church, not here. You are being the church out where God needs you to be the church, more than he needs you to be the church right here, right now. And I'm so excited about the possibilities of that. And it begins in your heart, and it extends to your home, through your household, and you don't have to break quarantine to be the church. Jesus said, for judgment I am coming to this world, that they which see not might see. They which see might be made blind. I think Jesus, as the light of the world, healed that blind man so that he could see that he saw more of the goodness of life than he might have been, than he might have been appreciating. And so that he could see just how blind some sighted people really are. But look at the manner of healing. Jesus spat in the dirt, made a spittle cake, and rubbed it on the man. Jesus fails at social distancing on this one. No sanitary protocols there. And I'll tell you, as I'm reading through this, every time, I'm cringing a little. It wasn't the spit, the dirt, the clay, and the pool of Siloam. God's people in the desert needed the right focus. Did that bronze serpent heal them? When they looked to the bronze serpent, they were looking for God. They need to be looking for God. God's people needed to stop looking back to Egypt, to slavery. 
They need to start looking through the wilderness and through the hardship to a better life and a promised land. We need to see. We need to be beacons of hope shining forth with the word of life. To be light in the Lord, walking as children of light. We need to not just be looking to Jesus, but seeing the manifestation of God's love among us. To celebrate it among us. To recognize our call to be evidence of that love in ourselves for all the world to see. This is a time for all of us to be the people of God and not houses of worship. We must embrace the gift of sight that we have been given and stand before the judgment of the world, even before, before Christ, and say, Worship the Lord. I will worship the Lord, just as that blind man did. Let us join together in that worship. Let us pray.